In the spring of 1977, I gave George a copy of my article on Ernst Bloch's theory of fascism, which appeared in the 11th issue of New German Critique. Bloch, I argued, had written a heterodox analysis of fascism, emphasizing the multiple temporalities characteristic of fascist culture. George wasn't impressed. Bloch, he said, was a Schwetzer. Of course he was right. Bloch's prose was florid, excessive, and opaque. But rereading it today, I'm also struck by how much of George was in that old article. Like Bloch, George regarded fascism as a cultural synthesis composed of many disparate elements, focused thought, political religion, or civic religion, aesthetic spectacle, etc. Like Bloch, George saw fascism as both a longing for a mythical past and as a desire for an imperceptible authenticity lacking in modernity. Yet there was one dimension of George's approach that was virtually absent in Bloch, the primacy of anti-Semitism as the most effective vehicle of folkish thought. He called it, as we've heard, an anti-Jewish revolution. All of these papers do an excellent job of distinguishing between classical fascism and contemporary varieties of the radical right. The new face of fascism is, of course, xenophobic, Islamophobic, anti-globalist, and authoritarian. But to what extent is populism an adequate term to describe these movements. Enzo, it seems to me, rejects the designation in his new book, the, in his new book, The New Faces of Fascism. And others have also called into question some aspects of the populist ideal. Jan Werner Müller, my colleague, who has written on populism, has also argued that contemporary authoritarian populisms invoke racist stereotypes but they have learned, this is the important point, have learned from the 20th century and they scrupulously avoid anti-human rights discourse and violence on a mass scale, lest they be tarred with the brush of dictatorship. Enzo's rich and judicious paper is critical of those aspects of George's work that remained underexplored or even neglected especially fascism's debt to and continuation of colonial racism. He also underlines George's reluctance to engage with anti-fascism. This is important in part because, because George was active in the British movement for the Spanish Civil War. It was his first political engagement. And anti-fascism was, for George, a totality which, quote, embraced the whole person in itself an ideology to which I subscribed. Characteristically, in the late 1930s, he admired William Temple, the Archbishop of York, and at the same time, he became something of a socialist, I say something of a socialist, an admirer of the British intellectual Harold Lasky, who played an important role in the left wing of the Labour Party. Later, George acknowledged that the fascist movement the anti-fascist movement created its own, and for me, very seductive myth. But Enzo is entirely right that he chose not to apply his own cultural interpretation to those anti-fascist myths and to the culture of anti-fascism, which had its own dramaturgy and political aesthetic. Anti-fascism ignored fascism's popular support Anti-fascism ignored the electoral successes of fascism, and it emphasized conspiracy, blackmail, brutality, pathology, and sexual deviance of the, of the fascists. Think of Willy, Willy Munzenberg's brilliantly staged mass campaigns in the 1930s and his influence on Hollywood via Fritz Lang that shaped the public face of anti-fascism in the 1930s. Andreas Hussen takes up where Bloch leaves off. What are the contemporary cultural tropes characteristic of the new face of fascism? Bloch's famous Ungleichzeitigkeit represented an interwar reality of pre-industrial rural 
and lower middle class society up against the modernity of industrial capitalism. But this, he says, no longer applies. The cohabitation of digital media and, incre and capital increasingly obliterates such stark temporal differences. He draws on Adorno, Leventhal, Gutemann, and Neumann to paint an ominous portrait of the alt-right whose potency feeds on what he calls neoliberalism's war on public goods. T today's alt-right culture is located not in an atavistic authoritarian personality or in pre-modern myth, but in a chaotic assault of social media on the public sphere and democracy. In an earlier article, he brilliantly showed that Breitbart and company routinely singled out the Frankfurt School for undermining the totality of American culture. Adorno and Horkheimer, this is a shorthand Jewish conspiracy theory, are responsible for the sexual revolution, feminism, civil rights, and identity politics. We are confronted with a new social formation quite different from Mossi's fascism as a revolutionary third way between liberalism and communism. Consequently, I would pose the question to all of the panelists, to what extent does the old right adopt an inverted new left strategy of insurgency, drawing on while demonizing cultural Marxism to mount a total assault on democratic institutions? What would constitute an effective counter strategy? A strong case for retaining some aspects of the older definition while introducing many new and novel elements is Molly Nolan's nuanced analysis of gender politics. She demonstrates that today's radical right parties avoid the hypermasculinity characteristic of anti-war fascism while promoting ethno-nationalism and assaulting women's rights in the guise of gender ideology. In Western Europe, at least, traditional ma male-dominated fascist parties have given way to parties with women in leadership and even as their public face. Though they insist on natural women's roles in traditional families, in addition to a collection of pro-natalist policies and anti-immigrant rhetoric, some radical right parties even embrace a limited version of gay and lesbian rights. Abortion is not universally condemned. In contrast to interwar fascism's radical right parties have been engaged in sustained outreach to women, even if these are relegated to family and social issues. Lastly, she shows that one of the key differences from interwar fascism is the radical right's embrace of neoliberal, pro-individualist, free market economics. This point, I think, raises a question also for all of the panelists. To what extent to, does today's radical right remain tied to the capitalism that its rhetoric sometimes disavows? This question, I'll come to my conclusion. One question that it seems to me has not received sufficient attention in this discussion is to what extent has liberalism been altered by the emergence of the new right. What I have in mind is that there seems to be a new mood among defenders of liberalism, or of the li some defenders of liberalism, or of the li liberal ideal, which might be called nostalgic or even apocalyptic. Characteristic of that mood is Joschka Fischer's essay, Goodbye to the West, where he claims that echoes that the West, the concept of the West, was inaugurated with the American intervention in World War I, took shape in the Atlantic Charter and NATO, and was ultimately characterized by the crucial global leadership of role of the United States after World War II. His implication is clear. The Western world, he writes, as virtually everyone alive today has known it, will certainly perish before our eyes. No less anxious is Roger Cohn, who worried in the New York Times that the core post-war belief in multilateralism, 
the creation of a rules-based world order sustained by international organizations was based on the assurance that history could not repeat itself. What would an invigorated or reinvigorated liberalism look like if it did not succumb to the cultural pessimism that is the reverse side of what Enzo calls the new face of fascism? The problem is not with the anxiety per se, but rather with the insistence that Europe has no independent sources of resistance to post-fascism, and more importantly, that without the insurance policy of the United States, the European commitment to democracy and memory are unsustainable. In other words, George's legacy asks us to think about how liberalism can respond to the new face of fascism. <laughs>